yeah, so it is time for you to finally meet our, our great audience uh, and to get their thoughts and questions on her <laughs> music and her life in general. So we do have a slightly reduced amount of time for this section. Uh, I will try and take the questions in rounds of two or three, uh, just until we close. So to the audience, if you do have a question, could you please just raise your virtual hand and then come on to camera and off mute when you're called and then you can just talk to us directly. Okay, uh, a reminder, if you do feel more comfortable drafting your question in the chat, then you can do so. Uh, and I can ask on your behalf and I'll blend it into the segments. So if you can make a start, you can have a question at all. Edward, did you have? Oh, you put your real hand up. No, about your hand. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to? No, no, it's, it's up. I'll ask a question. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank sure. you very much, Nomsa, for a very stunning presentation. And I think he's somebody who has uh, studied Miriam Makeba very well. Um, but uh, having said that, perhaps uh, maybe if you could say a bit about her humility, because the kind of person that she was, having achieved the kind of um, achievements, yes. kind of feats that she did. She always remained grounded. Uh, that's number one. And number two, mm. perhaps maybe you could tell us a bit more about how you got her to really cooperate in terms of this book. Um, uh, you know, can you tell us a bit more? Because I don't think what you've just said mm. is, is, is all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. Um, well, I think your your first question answers the second. It was her humility. So she took, well, I mean, at the time I was, well, less than half her age. I had never written anything before. I, well, not a book write a small art matter. And I was like, I'd really love to read your story. Part of that humility wasn't to look at me and say, who's this young upstart? It was to be like, okay. And I, I think I said a bit in the beginning, but obviously the sound might've been bad, but she did, you know, I remember her literally, you know, she laughed at first, but then later it was that thing of like, why not? Why not? You know? We are young, yeah, and I was young. <laughs> we are black and we are women. And I said, that was so affirming. So for her to have even affirmed that and to have given me like the chance of even letting her into her space, I think that was, you know, serious level of humility because she was a huge celebrity. She didn't have to spend time talking to whoever or nobody or letting them into her space. Writing a book is a very personal thing. It's an emotional thing. And there were obviously things that I didn't understand either by age or by just, ex you know, life experience. So you ask someone questions and what would you'd feel are ridiculous questions. But that was, you know, part of her humility that she and I think part of what I was saying about her ability to cross bridges and cross, cross boundaries is that part of her thing of understanding that someone's got a question, I must, I must answer that. I must try and see it from the way they see it. So I think, yes, I think it was a lot of that opportunity where, you know, sometimes circumstances, you just meet people, but if you meet somebody with a greater sense of purpose, and I think part of her sense of purpose was um, in writing the book, while, while there was a bit of it, you know, a lot of people like, why, why would she want to write a book? For her, there was some value in documenting that South Africa's freedom and Africa's freedom had come through, through collective effort. So she didn't want it, the story to just be left as a story of just a few people who fought the struggle. She also wanted to go back and say, no, Kenneth Kaunda stood for South Africa. No, um, Seko Ture, you know, there were lots of people who fought for the struggle for freedom on the continent was a collective effort. And I think that's what she wanted to document, that freedoms aren't fought by one great person. 
It's, it wasn't about her, Miriam Makeba, and my voice. It was about collective voices. So I think that's why she also felt it was important to write the book. Um, yes, but you definitely write about her humility. I think that was a very strong trait. I hope I've answered. Or do you want more? <laughs> no, 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 no. You, you, you did, you did. Thank you so much. You did, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Stephen. Stephen, would you like to come off mute to ask a question? Hello? Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Um, I will just, uh, I don't want to ask a question, but I'm just um, sad because this is the last uh, lecture. And uh, I've been reading also some of the chapters before the lecture itself. There is a certain connection between uh, the lecture and what you read. You tend to feel the person better through the lecture. Like, for example, with uh, Maria Matev, one thing that I liked about it was, uh, I think is she was like, she was alive again to us. So I, I wish possibly if there were more lectures than just 10, to help us actually to understand them. You might understand it conceptually, what you were saying, for example, if you go back to Dan and stuff. So that's one thing that I, one thing that I liked about uh, her was, it was very soft spoken. Some of us are activists and we have got very strong voices to speak out, but she was so soft the way she expressed it. The nature of conviction that she mm. delivers was quite effective. And I found that very, uh, I think very attractive and very, I don't know how to express it, but thank you for that. Yes, no, I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. You know, that being, because I think it's also just another way of looking at life, just, to, I totally agree. I wish there were more, um, can you hear me, <laughs> Prof? <laughs> more lectures, <laughs> Nigel? More lectures are asked for, are being requested here. But definitely, I think in terms of um, um, Miriam Makeba being soft spoken, I think it's also that lesson that sometimes you don't have to be aggressive to get a point across, do you? It's, you know, it's how, it's how do you fight? You know, that that was a thing you can, if your point is valid enough, it doesn't have to be as a, as a fight or as an argument, if you are clear about what it is you're working towards and you have a sense of purpose, you can articulate your views, you know, even if it's repeatedly, but you'll be heard. And yes, it took Miriam Makeba 30 years, but <laughs> to finally get home. And it took a whole generation for South Africa to finally be free, but for every country on the continent to be free. And some of our countries aren't in a state of freedom that we, are, we can be proud of. Some of our countries still need a lot more work wherever we are, you know. But yes, there's, um, there's ways that messages can be put across. Um, yes, I agree with you, Stephen, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question. Uh, please correct me if I say your name wrong. Is it Huawei? Do you want to come off mute? Did you have a question? Is it Huawei? Okay, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. I'm going to go over to the chat because there's quite a few questions in there as well. Um, so one question from Rhoda, oh, as a Caribbean person, could you say a little more on her life with Kwame Ture? Okay. Oh yes, no, um, the great Stokely um, debate. I, I really, you know, I think that was also just, um, thank you so much for that question. Um, well, I think, they initially met anyway um, through Harry Belafonte, well, through the civil rights. Um, I mentioned a bit in my presentation that when Miriam got to America, um, it was through Harry Belafonte. There's another Caribbean person for you. So apart from introducing her to civil rights 
activists and getting her to perform. Um, Miriam Makeba, you know, would do concerts for for the civil rights for the for the movement for the civil rights movement as well as for the you know the African for African liberation movement. And it was, you know, through going to these marches and going through to performances with, um, with Harry Belafonte that she met Stokely Carmichael. Um, Stokely Carmichael was, of course, younger than her, but she liked the fact that he was radical. Ah, but they met before in America, but where they eventually met is that Stokely Carmichael, as a leader of SNCC, the Students Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, he was invited, first of all, to, to, uh, to Guinea for what was then Guinea Conakry, because Guinea Conakry was having a Congress, which is also, you know, there were a lot of con Congresses happening around the world around the issues of Pan-Africanism. And they knew that Stokely was out, outspoken and Stokely Carmichael had been invited there. So he had been invited to Guinea and that's where he properly met Miriam Makeba. And from there, obviously they started spoke, speaking, shared ideals, I guess about black power, um, African power shared, you know, just, I mean, Stokely, I think was somebody who was such a pan-Africanist. He, he, he saw himself as an African. So of course, immediately identified with her, but she was beautiful, wasn't she? So it was also just a meeting of minds and um, a meeting of um, shared spirit of Africa's freedom, freedoms for the continent. And then I think a shared spirit of like, there's need to speak up. She was soft-spoken, but when she got on stage, she could articulate a bit of what Stokely was saying um, quite radically behind the scenes. So I think that they had a, a very powerful relationship that way. And I know that even long after he, you know, long after they, cause they were married for 10 years and they lived together in Guinea, but long after um, they separated and he married somebody else, they, ke they kept in contact and they would still speak about the same issues. And even when he traveled to South Africa a few times, their relationship, continued. But I think it was just that that really that shared sense of belief in, in freedoms, freedom of Africa, individual freedoms, personal freedoms, and just dignity of people. So I think, yes, coming from different worlds that they, you know, um, the different worlds that they came from, and the different age groups that they came from. I mean, quite tellingly, I, Miriam, even, you know, Bachishi, um, loved Africa, or well, being in Guinea. She even left Guinea and Stokely was that committed to Guinea. He died and he's buried there. So, you know, I think that's somebody with a strong sense of a commitment to something. And now what's uh, just a last thing on Stokely, which I was Stokely Carmichael, which I always just admired was his sense of, um, what is the word? You know, when you read about him or when she spoke about him, his concept of ready for revolution. You know, you're always wanting to change. You're always wanting a better world. And you always, you know, like I say, he was radical, of course, in his younger days when he was a young militant, uh, left raising his, foot, his fist for black power. But I think he must have also been a very, you know, because she was soft. So obviously there was a meeting of minds that was beautiful. And just in terms of just the last thing on just that Caribbean aspect, you know, there was a whole sense when they got married of, you know, um, you know, people used to, well, at least how she put it is when she and Stokely got married, the idealists were like, oh, this is like a marriage between the Caribbean and Africa, oh, uh, African America, you know, this was Africa, African unity at play. <laughs> But I mean, it was deeper than that. It was just about people with shared idea, ideals and shared values who just really got along. And I think both had, because Miriam Makeba also had a very good sense of humor. So I think they also just laughed a lot because Stokely seems to have been witty. 
I don't know whether it, an it answers the broader pictures, uh, the broader questions, but yes, um, I just thought that was that was a beautiful relationship that they had. Thank you. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that was just... Yeah, that's no, great. great, thank you. Uh, Huawei, mm -hmm. do you want to try again or else I can read out the question that you've put in the chat? So do you want to come off mute, off mute or I can read your question? Did you have your hand up? No? Okay. I will. There's a question here in the chat uh, related to her marriages again. So mm. there's four different husbands. Uh, how long did each marriage last? And to what extent did these marriages relationships affect her career? You probably mentioned some of this already. Um, okay. but that was another question there as well. All right. Um, four, uh, she actually had five but um, <laughs> the, her first husband was in South Africa, uh, the father of her child. She only had one daughter. Her marriage didn't last very long because um, it was, and I think that was also part of the, you know, part of the activism point that, you know, like she spoke about and that it was a very violent marriage. So she left him. So I think part of the thing that you also talked about in the book is that you don't stick in a marriage that doesn't work, you know, when a man beats you up. So she left them. So that marriage didn't work. And it would be a message that she would also tell to some of the girls like at the center that never get yourself into relationships where you're abused. So in that way, you know, she was using her book and her story as a, as a way of saying, okay, I was young, I was married, I had a child, but as a woman, you don't have to stay in a marriage that doesn't work. Uh, second marriage was also just, it didn't last very long, maybe about a year. Um, she was married to a musician called Shuna Pele, but that, um, that marriage didn't work because of just going different ways in their careers. He was getting opportunities in England and she was getting opportunities in America. And I guess at the time being a black American, America's offered a better, a black African America offered a bit better opportunities. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what those dynamics were, but she took the opportunities of going to. No, I think she just took the opportunity of Harry Belafonte was already successful and he was opening doors for her. <laughs> so that marriage didn't last. But again, um, with Shona, they were friends up until, you know, like up until her death, with Shona Pele. So her marriage ended, but her friendships endured with the people she went. Then of course, the third marriage was with Huma Sekela, who was also a great South African musician. But that I would believe was just, they were in exile, familiarity of someone from home, trying to build, I believe, you know, like, you know, you don't know where people's things are. But, um, and then of course her marriage was Stokely Carmichael. Marriage, again, I think, were, from what she said, was not something that, I think, just the, the sense of having stability, of having a partner, as opposed to being unhappy with one person. Um, when things don't work, you move, but you move on with grace and dignity, with appreciation of why certain people were, were in your life. And as you know, I think it's something that she taught me having been, been a younger person working with an elder person. It was, yes, there's some things that are sacred, but what was sacred wasn't so much that we in a marriage, but what we in a friendship and we in a relationship. And that's why every relationship she came out of, she remained friends with those people until the day she died. So, that's that's her on her marriages. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, like I say, you know, it's just from a bit of what she might have told me, and some of it on what one felt from how she's Kai, how she passed on her messages. I am. Mm. Mm. Have I? Can you hear me? Yeah, you froze. Mm. Oh, did I? Oh, <laughs> am I back? With your eyes closed, but you're back now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't fall asleep. Mm. Mm. Yes. Okay, thank you. We do have another question from, is it Mohal? Do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much mm -hmm. um, for a great presentation and um, some really fantastic um, information on Miriam Mageba. I, I just wanted to, to say and um, mm -hmm. um, ask Nomsa, 
about um, just uh, her journey. Um, I don't think that with due respect, um, Mum Miriam Mageba was necessarily um, highly politically polit politicized when she left um, South Africa. Yes. And I base this mostly on her music, you know, Bopata Pata, you know, those are really dance oven songs talking about um, African traditions, African life, you know, in the township and the hardships of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, you know, the, 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 it, there was a high political consciousness. But mm -hmm. I think that her journey to um, Guinea um, particularly at a time when Sekuture and his after Kwame Nkrumah, all the Pan-Africanists, uh, mm -hmm. as, as well as uh, Kwame Ture, I think uh, mm -hmm. we begin to see a political consciousness. Even in mm -hmm. her music, it begins to be shaped more into freedom, more into liberation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that her, her Pan-Africanism also widens. Um, and mm. she, as she begins to understand and identify with the African independence uh, movement. So I think mm. that um, her, her tour of Guinea itself, I yes. think played a tremendous role in politicizing her and mm. um, really Pan-Africanizing her. That's yes. my view. Yes, no, thank, thank you for that. You know, I, I do agree that he has uh, Guinea gave a different kind of awakening. Um, but I think, um, and I like to think, and again, this is a difficulty, like when you doing, when, like I said, writing a book with somebody, when you're looking back on your life in hindsight, and then you sort of talk about where you, you know, like what sort of decisions you were making when you were, you know, she was 70 when she was writing the book. So when she looks about her activism as a 30-year-old or 28-year-old speaking at, you know, the United Nations, did she really get it? Um, she, yes, she got it in a, in a sense that she knew that there were so many people who were in exile. So even like if you go back before she even left South Africa, if you go, who were her friends at the time? She was close friends with somebody like Dorothy Masuka. Dorothy Masuka was writing songs that eventually got her deported from South Africa in 1959, 1960. So you know that your friends, you know that you've been critical about apartheid, the apartheid system. You know, you know you've been critical about the government. Um, you know, they, there was, there's a song that Miriam Makeba sang called Sophia Town is Gone. So, how much she was writing about um, writing her own songs, you know, like um, you don't you don't say, but there was a consciousness that we're living in this system where oh we can't even it's immor there's an immoral immoral immorality act where you can't date across the color, the color line. She married an Indian man. Her second husband Sunny was Shuna Pillai. He was Indian. So she broke all those rules. So you know there's something wrong with rules that need to be broken. So there is a political awakening. You know that there's some injustice in some things. So she knew that um, already before leaving South Africa, she knew that she had to leave South Africa almost you know, underground. She had to duck her way out of the country because she knew that there was a system that was wrong. So there is an awareness whether one is activist about it, but you know that a situation is wrong. But definitely by the time she got to America and she was now, she couldn't come back home. And, you know, maybe trouble happens and many more South Africans are uh, forced into it. You know, there's a, there was a journalist, uh, Nat uh, Nakasa, who ended up committing suicide and exile. There's so many stories of South Africans, South African students who've been forced away from South Africa because apartheid is oppressing them. So I think definitely, you know, there's a growing consciousness about injustice. There's a definite political awareness. There's a definite 
awareness that a system is wrong. Um, and then, um, like, yes, you do mention that by the time she got to Guinea, there was a different understanding about the African politics. But that African politics, she was already aware, aware of it in America because of the large community of African. Um, I mentioned a bit in my presentation that because 1960 was declared by the UN as um, the year of Africa, because in 1960, about 17 largely Francophone countries got independence. Over the next few years, you know, other countries would get Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia. So you go to Africa and you can see all, all these countries getting their independence and their freedom, but South Africa isn't. I remember she, well, her telling her anecdote, oh, when, you know, like when the independence in 1963, they all used to think, sing, ah, South Africa, free in 63. But <laughs> she didn't realize that it was going to take another two decades and towards the end of her time and after Gideon, after losing her, her children, she actually wondered, will I ever make it back to South Africa? Will South Africa ever be free? So yes, so, so you know, you, she went through those experiences and you go to, you know, you go to those countries, I mean, those journeys. So also Guinea, while it was a good place for her at some stage, she couldn't understand after staying in Guinea for so, so long, while some citizens of the country were starting to be against the great revolutionary Seko Ture. Seko Ture had brought the country to freedom. But I, I 25 years in power, uh, no, <laughs> people, <laughs> people also, a lot of Guineans also turned against her to say, why are you still friends with this dictator or whatever word they were using? So obviously, you know, political journey changing and growing and different experiences and everywhere she goes. But yes, you're right. You know, I think different, you know, interactions and interrelationships, you know, what, what she learned through Harry Belafonte, what she learned with, um, through Stokely Carmichael, even shifting her politics around the very sensitive issue of whether it's Palestine, the Palestinian situation, which was something that, you know, like affected her even at a, at a, at a young stage that she got co conscious of. So I'm saying, yes, she obviously went through her, her changes. Her dedication was definitely towards South Africa's liberation, but there was a larger global consciousness about what do freedoms mean for individuals, for nations, for women. So yes, no, I, but I do get your point definitely on how Guinea might have been a turning point for her. Mm. Thank you. Thank uh, you for that. Mm. Got another question from Lorato, who has mm. said, I love her resilience. I would love to know what kept her going in those gloomy days, coming across challenges and being away from home, like the time she was not allowed to go and bury her mother. I think um, like think what, what kept her going is um, first of all, like, you know, like just a bit of the anecdote I gave now that they said free, South Africa is going to be free and apartheid is going to end. So when you're living in hope <laughs> and you think, okay, maybe next year things will get better. Okay, the Rivonia trials just happened. Our leaders have been arrested, but maybe in '66 <laughs> we'll be free. You know, I think you keep on living in hope. So resilience. I, I think we all have to. We, if you believe in something, and that was the belief. It was the belief that, and I think she says a bit in her, in her clip. There was a belief that I'm on the side of righteousness. Black people have dignity. We can't be oppressed forever. Apartheid is wrong. So yes, so there's resilience knowing that systems that are evil cannot go on forever. But I mean, we've all had different experiences of where evil can endure, please, 400 years later, <laughs> or you know, whatever it is, we're fighting for our freedoms. But I think as a person that you have to keep on believing in something 
but she also, her resilience wasn't also because she was sitting back. Huh? So she knew I can't go home to bury my mother, um, but I can go home one day um, and I've got other family. And unfortunately for her, you know, that resilience, you keep on going. Unfortunately for her, it lasted 30 years. And when she eventually got home, her whole, all her siblings, where all the siblings had passed away. She only had one brother, brother left. She lost her mother while she was gone, five of her siblings. But, you know, she still came back. And, you know, I guess, you know, life, we don't even understand how this life works in such interesting ways. Well, she lived long enough to see great grandchildren. <laughs> so I don't know, life is a different way of, yes, yeah, so resilience, I guess we also just have to keep on saying, you know, a different path. But if, you st if you're standing for something and working towards something, and I think that's what a lot of the politicians, if we talk about politicians, or if we talk about whether it's a political situation, or whether it's a moral situation, how do you spend 27 years in jail and what keeps you going? if you've been sentenced, but you think that I'm gonna come out and, you know, end up being a peace negotiator for other countries around the world or negotiating for peace in my own country. But definitely resilience is a powerful word you use there. But I also think part of that resilience was also saying that she only had one daughter, her daughter, she had grandchildren. So you live for other things. You live for the day that they can also have a better, better life, I think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> These are big questions, but yes, definitely resilience is there. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, definitely, got, I agree with you. Got a resilience. question in the chat. Mm. Um, mm. It's a question from Noah, who has said Miriam McCabe was a freedom fighter through songs. Did she reproduce herself in many younger singers? in terms of political militancy regarding today's challenges? If yes, would you be able to name some young singers, female musicians in particular? I'm eager to listen to them. If no, then it's disappointing. Her legacy is not well honored. It would be as if we're stuck in a cultural quagmire. Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a very huge, uh, that's a very huge question in terms of, but I'm saying that, um, I said in, in terms of, you know, like the replicating Miriam Makeba is also um, for different causes. You know, Miriam Makeba was militant on the level of that she was thinking of South Africa's freedom and Africa's freedom. And now we're living in a time where all our countries are technically free. Um, for young musicians, what are you fighting for? Are you fighting? Yes, um, you're going to take a stand against gender rights. It, it becomes it's a it's a whole it's a whole different kind of battle or a whole different militancy. Um, and I know that there are some voices who who are heard. They're not singing anything like, but I know uh, in South Africa right now, and I can't think of who who I'd say right now. But I know that, oh, people like Tandi Zamzai, I think, uh, people who stand up and say, um, who perform at a concert because the main issue is around GBV, gender-based violence. So they'll come. Um, I see somebody, somebody, yes, yeah, somebody definitely is agreeing. I'm seeing somebody there has also mentioned Tandi Swa. I totally agree. Sipo Kazi. These are South African musicians who are young. So on one level, they've been inspired by her music. So her sound, you know, her style of music and what she did. So they've definitely taken a lot of energy from, from her. But in terms of issue-driven issue or activist-driven, I, I can't think of anybody who's got, but I say that the issues are different, but you know that there are people who step forward and say for a certain cause or for a certain issue. I know at a time in South Africa, there was like, you know, lots of concerts around, there was a whole issue of xenophobia or Afrophobia, and a lot of musicians were getting together to do concerts. 
I can't name any of them like off the cuff. Obviously, I'd think about them or I'd know that, or oh, this person is at a concert. But in terms of issues, I think, and I think this is also the other thing, you know, like when we lose that spirit of activism around general issues that affect, that affect us in society, when we, we become a bit too complacent or we become a bit too, what is it, um, in, insular. So at least in the struggle for continental freedom, people got together because they knew that we must work together to be free. But um, now that everybody's got their freedom on the surface, no, we need to get back to, to standing up for issues, standing up for things that are unjust within our society, standing up for where we know that, you know, there's injustice in country, we should collectively get together and say, this is something worth fighting for. But, you know, like, I think we become a bit like, I don't know if it's the right word, yeah, dissipated in this world, where maybe, maybe platforms like this, where we find issues and then you say, okay, if there's a pan-Africanist ideal, what is it? If the ideal is only just to be proud of our identity or to, you know, or to decolonize our education, so whatever, whatever the ideal is, the more collective and the more driven people are by issues, the more we're likely to get results and the more Miriam Makebas we can get out of this world. So definitely in terms of a style of music and she was, you know, she she's she had a following, and a lot of people, young musicians, will say, "Oh, Miriam Makeba, that's my, you know, they everybody wants to sing like Miriam Makeba." But Miriam Makeba's was, singing was also very deep because she was singing about things that were close to her heart. So you can't, unless you have a cause and a mission and something that really is in the gut, then maybe you can never sing like Miriam Makeba.